Well, if we're addressing all the controversy, I fired Alex <laughs> because he. My biggest question about your relationship would be: Gosh, we're gonna go there. <laughs> Fear mongering thumbnails. Oh, sacrificing your twenties. I believe there's a god, but I don't. All right, cool. Graham Stefan. Hey, this is cool. I saw in your first podcast you said for me to come on. Dream guys, did you see the clip or you I saw did. the full? You no, no, the I saw whole... the full thing. Wow. Yeah, as soon as you posted, I watched the full. I've I've seen every episode you guys have done. No way. Wow. Yeah. Do you watch them in times two? Uh, I do. Okay. Everything is in times. Does that two. still count as full watch time? Though? It doesn't. It counts as half watch time. No. Yeah. Uh, wait, actually, it's actually, watch time is like how many yeah, minutes physical? they actually spend on YouTube. It's not come like on, how man. many. You're, minutes you're they lowering our numbers. <laughs> Whatever. You could watch Ice Coffee. Yeah. Do you watch Ice Coffee Hour and Two X Speed or one? No. I sometimes even slow down to like. Are you point serious? No. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it point two five speed. Just so I get every nugget. <laughs> That's cool. No, but I I don't want to say I appreciate you inviting us into your home. I want to say I appreciate you letting us barge into your home. Yeah. Uh, truly an honor. I feel like you're the founder of Finance YouTube. Like you built the pond that I've been swimming in the last four years. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's been there's been people before me, though. Like, in fairness, Ty Lopez was one of the first people on YouTube okay. uh, for business. Grant Cardone uh, beat the bush, was one of the first people to talk about financial independence. Jeremy Financial Education was making videos mm. very early on. Uh, there were, like, a few, like, trendsetters way back then. Alex Becker. True. Remember that? He was were making business content. Were you guys far in between? Like, did he, he start that much He started, earlier? like, two years before me. But did anybody do it like as big as you? I don't think so. Not from 2018 to 2021 or two. Hmm. Not for like for those four years. I think I really pushed it in terms of like what you could do with finance YouTube. What do you think of like some of the guys now that are this new generation of finance YouTubers? (sighs) The quality is like through the roof. So that's one thing that like, I've definitely not improved my quality. Like Mm. I still have the same set as you can see. (laughs) The towels are still there. (laughs) It's the same thing that I had in 2017. The same camera, the same lights, the same towels, everything is the same. But now I'm seeing these videos and it's like the production quality is insane. Like you could tell they have spent months making content. But do you think that actually helps? Like the production quality? It can. I think to a certain degree it can. But then you have other people that just turn on a camera and they, they talk for 20 minutes, no edits, and those do even better. But I don't know. For me, I'm intimidated by quality because I can't keep up with that. Mm-hmm. You know? I feel like you don't have to do that. I mean, people, just like you, you're, you've been relevant for so long. It's You don't have to make those super high quality produced Iman movies, you know. But yeah. speaking of that, um, we had a couple of guests on, and you said you watched all of our episodes. Yeah. What do you think about some of the guys we've had on? I like them all. I respect all of them. Uh, Iman, especially his editing, is mm. crazy. So okay. I I think he was the one that kind of started that trend with like the side camera. Mm-hmm. I noticed everyone copying that as soon as he started doing that. And I go on Twitter all the time, and you see people saying like, "I want to hire an editor that edits just like Iman's videos." It's the Iman Hermosi style. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like I see the fiber gigs. It's I will edit Hermosi Iman Gazi style. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it's definitely a trend, and you could tell like who watches Iman mm-hmm. and some of these other finance guys based on that side camera angle. <laughs> Exactly. So you're not going to see me doing that, but but what do you think about like the actual message they're preaching? Because I feel like a lot of them are insanely on the abundance everything mindset, and yeah. I feel like you come from a more scarcity. frugal scarcity point of view. I've been scarcity all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I've just I've I've from the very beginning I've just thought like as a real estate agent, this is the last commission I'm ever going to make, and how am I going to live off of this for the rest of my life? On YouTube, I kind of thought every day is going to be the last day. YouTuber lifespans are so short, so how can I make this last? Um, I've just gone at it from a different perspective. I just think it, it's whatever resonates better with you as a person. There are some people who naturally are just like, abundance everything. I don't mind spending all my money because I know I'm going to make it back. Jason Oppenheim is a really great example of that. He is the polar opposite in terms of like saving money. And we've had talks about this before on the podcast uh, where he talks about he has no problem spending everything he makes because he's so confident he's going to be able to make more the next year. And just mm. it's this unwavering uh, self-reliance that he has that some people just naturally have. I, I don't. I tend to be a lot more conservative. Do you think that's a good message to push to millions of people, especially young kids like all these other guys are saying, you're going to make it back, just spend it. You know, is that a good message for the youth? Depends on the person. I think it. I think it's really just comes down to the individual. I I would say my thinking of being conservative is safer, but I think it also limits the upside. Like I wonder what would have happened in 
you know, 2020 had, I just said, all right, I'm going to reinvest everything I had back mm-hmm. into getting a huge studio, hiring people, getting script writers. Like Ali Abdal did that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ended up scaling back. But I mean, you can't deny he was putting out three videos a week on evergreen topics that were long tailing and he was gaining 5,000 subscribers a day mm. for, you know, two years or something like that. I mean, he's surpassed me in subscribers. So, so do you think that's kind of hurting you? Like just the scarcity mindset. Do you think it's limiting your growth? Because that's something I struggle yeah. with. Like I grew up reading uh, Millionaire Next Door and watching your videos. Books, so yeah. I also have that like frugality state of mind. But I feel like at this point it's limiting me. Like I, I, I want to think bigger. Yeah. Um, I went through a huge transformation, I would say the last two years. We had a lot of people on the podcast. Mm. Formosi was one of them. And every person I say, like, hey, what's your advice from me? And these are people who are way more successful than me. So I like hang on to every word they say. And a lot of them say, oh, you need to scale up and you need to do this and that and create a business. And I started going down those paths and I started exploring options of doing more. And I said more. uh, I said yes to more things. I started tinkering in new endeavors. And honestly, it was miserable. I couldn't stand it i was the most unhappy the more i tried doing Hmm. and it got to a point maybe about a year ago give or take where i just accepted this like hey that's not me i would much rather be in my office sitting right there editing videos planning videos and have a really small team that were just close friends Hmm. and i have no desire to scale up beyond that and i think it took a while for me to accept that that's just who i am so i'd much rather just kind of be you know small team and not I don't care anymore about like trying to build a hundred million dollar empire. Like I'm cool just taking it easy. And that's something that that took me a long time to realize is okay. But I want to see you're taking it easy. You're still like, <laughs> you're oh, still taking, going hard. Dude, I'm taking it easy compared to like three years ago. This is like a night, like three years ago, I never would have done this in the middle of the day. Really? Ever. No, we would have done this probably at 9 PM and I would okay. be completely stressed out because I'd have to plan my Friday video tomorrow. How far have you scaled back? Like what did you do before and where are you uh, now with like the output? Yeah. At the peak I was doing, I think it was 12 videos a week. And I did that. I did 12 videos a week for an entire year. And that was three on the main channel, three on the second channel, a podcast, three uh, vlogs. And I was editing like a third of those myself as well. It was a lot. Um, and then what else was I doing? The the coffee company. There were a few other like random things I was involved in. It was mostly content creation mm-hmm. though. Um, but it was all I thought about. And it got to a point where it became so unhealthy where I just thought of my opportunity cost if I did mm-hmm. anything. So if someone says like, hey, let's go and hang out and have dinner tonight. Mm-hmm. In my mind, I'd calculate, okay, what what's my time worth? How What's this going to set me back? How much more do I have to work the next day to make up for it? And this is going to cost me X amount. Is this Mm -hmm. worth that X amount to go to the dinner? And usually it would no. That's crazy. So like my mind was constantly going. How would you feel during that? Because I remember seeing like the constant uploads and I was uploading once a week and that was like getting to be mentally. How did that feel for you to just be on this like insane hustle train of just like constant, no days off? Did did you get burnt out? Did did. you feel anything? I did. Did Do you feel any emotions? No, not really. I was used to it though. Like, you have to remember, I was doing three videos a week since January of 2017. So that for me was like, you, you kind of like ramp up to it. So it wasn't like I went from zero to like three videos a week and just sustain that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was doing three videos a week since 2017. And back then, there was like no planning that went into those videos. I just like pick a topic that I wanted to talk about. No topics on finance had ever been covered on YouTube. Mm-hmm. So I was like kind of like the first to talk about whatever. And I could just, I could sometimes turn on the camera and talk for 30 minutes bare bones editing for 20 like do that Mm. so i could pass off that for the first year or so uh but i I was used to it and so i just i had a system i had a schedule and i just my biggest thing was i couldn't be distracted Mm -hmm. so like when i went in the office i closed the door and have to be in complete silence listening to classical music and that would be the only way i could plan out a video and i would just head down focus for 10 hours a day would you say that was kind of like you living out your mantra of sacrificing your 20s yeah, I would say so. But there was also like 90% of the time I loved it. Really? So yeah. It was you so were angry. happy in here at 9 p.m. stressing out? So happy. I don't, yeah, I don't in, know. In a weird way, I was, know, oh man. yeah. Yeah, because it, it was like a challenge. It was cool to talk about topics that I could share my perspective on. It was a real like creative outlet for me. 
So 90% of the time, I loved it. And it was all I wanted to do. Like, I would go to bed. Even I enjoyed the stress. So, like, I'd go to bed and just be excited to wake up the next morning because, like, I have something new to talk about. So, I looked forward to it. But, like, I I could only do that for so long before Mm -hmm. eventually I'm just burnt. And then I felt the quality started to suffer. Were you like that before the YouTube? Was that the same strategy when you were doing real estate? Yeah, yeah. Really? Same thing. I get obsessed wow. with like, if I find something, it's all I want to do. It's all I want to mm-hmm. think about. Um, kind of everything else falls to the side because it's like, I, I find this little focus. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to do this. Mm-hmm. So for me, real estate was was that exact focus and it was for like eight years. Yeah. I feel like people go past, they just disregard your real estate success. I mean, you were before YouTube on uh, Netflix, million dollars, uh, not million dollars. Um, Selling Sunset. Selling Sunset. You were on, ne- on Netflix. Well, actually, Selling, million dollar listing too. So really? Two seasons of wow. dollar listing. Sheesh. Yeah. Now I wasn't one of the main characters, but mm-hmm. I brought two deals to Madison Hildebrand. Okay. I couldn't I couldn't tell you what seasons they were. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But there were two lease deals that I brought on. That wasn't because of YouTube, right? It might have been No, gosh, no. That was that, 2010 or 2011. Oh, wow. So that was actually before YouTube. Way before. Oh, yeah, way before. Do you think you would have been further ahead if you never started YouTube, just career wise, financially? No, I'd be no. way further behind. Really? Oh yeah. Why do you say that? Uh Real estate only went so far and YouTube allowed me to scale in a way that I never would have been able to as a real estate agent. So YouTube, I would say, accounts for like 80% of mm-hmm. where I am today is from YouTube. Real estate was a good foundation though. Like if it wasn't for real estate, I never have any, anything to talk about in the beginning. Yeah. Towards the end of real estate though, were you hesitant to let go of it? Oh yeah. Really? I thought I would ruin my credibility if I wasn't a real estate mm-hmm. agent. <laughs> okay. I was terrified of that. Um, I looked at a lot of the other finance people and I was like, oh, they don't even do what mm-hmm. they do anymore. They just talk about how to do mm-hmm. that, but they don't actually do it. So I still went into the office almost every single day until 2020, until the COVID shutdown. Mm-hmm. So I was still making three videos a week. I was making more money doing YouTube than I was in real estate, but I kept doing real estate. Just out of principle? Yeah. Well, first, I like going into the office. So that, that for me okay. was like a way to get out of the house. I enjoyed everyone at the Oppenheim Group and I was still closing deals. Mm-hmm. Um, 2020, when everything shut down, that was the moment when they canceled open houses, like Mm. the national association of realtors, it's unsafe to do open houses on Sundays. And that was the point where I think it was like end of March of 2020. I was like, you know what? I'm, I should just do this full time because people have been telling me do YouTube full time since 2017. I was like, no, I can't do that Mm -hmm. because I was also afraid it was going to go to zero. So (laughs) I feel like that every day as well. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like every YouTuber does now. I think so. I, I have not met anybody who's like, oh, yeah, this is going to last forever. Mm-hmm. And if they do, it usually ends pretty quickly afterwards. Mm-hmm. So, like, I never wanted to be that person. Yeah, I think you've compared it before to an athlete where you have, like, four years. Mm-hmm. How many years are you in? Seven and a half. You're in overtime. Whoa. Actually, no, sorry, not seven and a half. Seven, seven years and two months. That's LeBron numbers. It is. <laughs> Dude, YouTube is forever time. Are you still... So. Are you still tapped in, like, with the current real estate market and the current trends? Are you you have a good grasp on that? Not as much as I used to be. Like, 2019 me really knew the Los Angeles market because I was mm. working as a real estate agent, too. So it's like when you're seeing maybe, like, a dozen properties a week and you're still showing around clients, like you get a better grasp. Now I look at the market, but I don't look in person. Mm. So, like, I'm still seeing what's going on, but you can't know the whole United States. Like, I'm just trying to learn... LA and Vegas. Are you buying right now? At I've, all? I've looked, but I can't find anything that makes any sense. Is it because of the interest rates? Partially, but also things are so expensive and competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, like I really want to buy commercial real estate. So I like what's going on in Vegas. There's a lot of new development. A lot of people are moving here. So I like the little strip centers. Mm-hmm. I like the mm-hmm. triple net real estate investments, just a single tenant in there uh, with the corporate guarantee. Like I like these things. But the issue that I'm finding is that like you're, you're, Buying them at like a six and a half percent return, mm-hmm. interest rates are going to be best case six and a half to seven and a half percent. So it's like already at a loss unless you put a lot of money down. But then you're also competing with people from California mm-hmm. who come in with cash. They're doing a ten thirty one exchange. They're you know this huge corporate. It's like I can't compete with that, and my returns are going to be pretty subpar. So. You know, but maybe I'm going to be wrong. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's better to buy now, but I just don't. See you don't it. think it's a good time to get in the market right now for commercial? For, okay, for so anything for commercial real estate. It, personally, I think no, but I could be wrong. For residential real estate, I don't think so because you could rent the same house for half the price. Like here in Vegas, mm-hmm. there's 
seven hundred thousand dollar homes that you could rent for. 2800 a month like that rent is so much cheaper than what your mortgage would be and then you also have to think well property taxes insurance all these other repairs and maintenance that go along with it uh the only reason to buy is really if you're going to stay there a very long time Mm -hmm. or you really want to make a bet on las vegas but when i look at like money in money out i just renting seems to make way more sense so So like who's who's buying right now because people are still people are still buying but it's just so much cheaper to rent. It's like, like you said, half off. I think some people have it ingrained that buying a home is the American dream. Mm. And for them, it's like, I want to own. And there is something to be said, in fairness, about owning a house. That you have this sense of pride and assurance that like this is yours. Mm-hmm. A landlord can't tell you to move. A landlord's not going to raise your rent. And that you own it. And there's a, just a sense of just accomplishment that I think comes with that that you don't get with renting. Mm. Um. So I think that plays into it. I'm more of a numbers person where I don't really care. It's just like, how much does something cost? And what are my options? And mm-hmm. so if the option is like, I pay double to own it or half the price to rent, I'd rather rent it. But yeah. that's that's just me. Yeah, I've been on the strain of like kind of hating on um, real estate lately. Yeah. Because it, it's true because you do have all these concerns that, you know, you got to do the maintenance. You got to, there's so many moving parts. Where there's like other places to just funnel your money where you don't have to think about it and you can focus on a business. But I will say I am really glad that like I've bought the properties that I've bought just because it does give me that peace of mind. Like I can touch them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Part of me would love to just sell everything, like all the properties. But the, mm-hmm. but the issue is that I, I'm locked in at such low interest rates right now. So well, kind of- you're, you're not like 2% for this house. Yeah, this one's 2.8%. Uh, another one in LA is 2.8%. Everything else is below three and a half. That's crazy. So like w- another one is like 3.375%. Uh, and the property tax basis are so low. Mm. So like my property tax basis on almost everything is like a third or a fourth of what it would be worth now. Wow. So it's like I'm getting 60% off property tax values just from that. So it's it kind of holds it to where like I've done the numbers and I'm like, if I sell it, Here's what I'm going to be getting, but then I have to pay tax to California on top of that. I have to pay the long-term capital gains uh, taxes. I then have to pay back some of the uh, depreciation recapture on that. And then I'm like, with what's left, I have to get a 7% return here Mm -hmm. for that to make sense. Can I get a 7% return? I could. Is it worth it? I don't know. So I wish I followed your footsteps and just like took out some loans when it was at 2%. You could go back to my videos in 2020 where I'm like, interest rates are at like under 3%. It does, like, it's so absurdly low mm-hmm. that I'm just maxing myself out from what I could like get. And I put as little money down. I just took out the biggest loans I could on obviously properties mm-hmm. that were either going to cash flow or that I was going to live in. Um, but to me, that was like a once in a lifetime. Now, maybe we'll eventually get back to that. I don't know. So that's kind of like what you've been doing with YouTube and real estate. But you have this successful podcast at this point. It's been really blowing up. Yeah. At this point, I mean, I, I don't want to put words in my mouth. I'm assuming it's making in the seven figures. No. No? No. Between You're, everything, it's not a seven figure no, venture? it's not. Okay. No. but that, that means we probably need to find better ways to monetize. But <laughs> but no, it, it probably makes a lot less money than you think. Really? Uh, yeah. Ad revenue, just just for pers- like for whatever reason, we make way less money in ad revenue than I would on a main channel video, like way less. I thought it would be more because you can just no. put, toss those minerals in. No. No? Uh-uh. The ad rates are lower on podcasts than they are on like a purely finance channel. Okay. The podcast is well, but it's not a seven-figure thing. But we've also really prioritized guest uh selection then we mm-hmm. have like money like there, there are episodes that i just mentioned to jack like i'd rather just a really great guest even mm-hmm. if it makes no money or loses money i just want the really good guest mm. so i don't really care um and i think jack is in the same position where we just really prioritize just getting the best episodes that we can how much of your time goes towards the podcast Lately, it's been like a decent amount because we've been traveling. Mm. Okay. So we have to travel to guests. And in the beginning, it was probably three hours a week Okay. on my end. Jack would spend half of his workday probably working on the podcast. And then that was mostly editing, uh, you know, guest planning. But now we're traveling. And so sometimes for one episode, we'll spend three days on it. Sheesh. It's like a day of travel, a day of filming, planning, everything, and a day travel back. So it could be like three days of work for one episode that you'll watch for an hour and a mm-hmm. half. 
So yeah, we know about that. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're learning that. Yeah. So at this point, with you putting in so much time, do you regret giving Jack fifty percent? No. No. Zero regret. No. Initially, I mean, obviously, <laughs> selfishly, I would like more. Selfishly. Okay. Um, but you know what? I think at the end of the day, Jack puts in so much work to the podcast, mm-hmm. and he's just as motivated as I am. So it's not lopsided whatsoever. It's not like I benefit more than him. It's completely equal, and it. I can't deny it's it's worked just out a for little the best. bit though. <laughs> just a little regret uh, yeah i would love a 60 40 so <laughs> jack ever wants it but you know what it, 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 it's he, he put in a lot of the work initially too you weren't really on board no in the beginning. it was funny uh the first episode uh his idea he came up with all these questions to ask me and you could watch it i mean mm-hmm. so it i look back at it every now and then it'll actually be four years coming up in may wow on that first episode of the podcast um i felt really mixed about it in the beginning the first few episodes, like I was 100% on board with. And then I looked at it. I'm like, oh. I was so busy. Like I remember I was telling mm-hmm, you yeah. like, that at that point, it was seven videos a week. I was working 12 hours a day. It was all I could think about. And the last thing I wanted to do is finish up at 8 p.m. And be like, oh, now I have to report a podcast for an yeah. hour and a half. And I really didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, Jack was the one that was pushing me. I was wow. like, no, you should do this. It's good. Just stick with it. And I did. And then I saw it as a good way to network. Because mm. keep in mind, back then it was ma- it was no money. I mean, it was making nothing. Uh, but I saw it as a really good way to network and meet a new person every single week. Mm-hmm. Colin and Samir are one of the, like the initial people that we had on, and I met them randomly walking down the street in Santa Monica, and it was an easy way to say, "Hey, by the way, just come on the podcast. I would love to talk to you." That's so much easier than saying, "Hey, let's grab a coffee or like let's hang out." Mm-hmm. So much easier to say, "Hey, come on the podcast," and everyone said yes. But is, isn't that a little crazy to just full on first time you meet? Yo, can you hop on the pod? No, because no? I had watched their content and okay. they had seen me. So it was a little bit more of like a, we knew who, like they, I looked at him and I'm like, wait a second, Samir? And he's like, Graham? And so it was one of those oh, things. So okay. it wasn't like a total like stranger thing. But even strangers, uh, if, if I know what they're doing or mm-hmm. know of their work, I absolutely say, really? hey, come on the podcast. Everyone's going to say yes. I mean, Beheza was one of the first ones on your, yeah. on your podcast. Was, yeah, you guys have never met before. Yeah. And but it's a cool way to meet. It's yeah, just like, but, hey, come on down and come on the podcast. But like in real life, like we were at the Taco Tuesday last night, and we saw the guys from Donut Media, and Teacher was like, "Yo, go ask him, go ask him <laughs> to be on the pod." And I just felt like it would be kind of almost pushy to just say, "Hey, you know, first time meeting, can you, but can you please hop on our podcast?" Do you it. would have been fine with it. Yeah. What's the strategy? How how would you do it? What's the cold approach method? <laughs> cold approach. All you got to do is say you walk up and neg okay. first. So you'd be like, "Hey, I like your hair. Mm. Did your mom do it?" Okay. And you're going to be kind of, and, uh, and then you say, out. Hey, come on the podcast. No, okay. <laughs> no, I would walk up if, if you're familiar with them. Uh-huh. I always walk up and it's not like planned, it's genuine, but like, I'd like, let's say we never met. Mm-hmm. I'd walk up to you and say, Hey, I really like your videos. I think they're really creative. How do you do it? And mm. you tell me like, I come up with these things and I'd be like the storytelling you do in the videos is incredible. If you're ever interested, like I have a podcast, if you'd want to come on, we'd love to have you on and we'll work around your schedule. So if you have like an hour free, I'll make it really easy for you. Whenever you're free, I'll I'll be there. Wow, you're um, good. <laughs> I like that. I like that. If you're ever interested, that yeah. makes it sound like not pushy. Yeah, that's a bar. And and there are some people that we followed up with for like a year to get them on the wow. podcast. And there and and there are people that I have on on the notes on mm-hmm. my phone that I look through every few months, and I'm like, I gotta follow up with this person. And so there there are people that I've been trying for like over a year to get on the podcast. They're like, not right now, but keep me wow. posted. And I will send an email six months later. Eh, yeah, maybe New Year, and then I follow up again. So, and eventually it works. Can you call? Can you call them out? I'd prefer not to because no. they know they're going to come on the podcast. Okay. Yeah. Is Andrew Tate one of them? No, you wouldn't ever. Maybe, maybe one day. Have you guys tried? Uh, he was open uh, initially. So before I even heard of Andrew Tate, like I've never heard of this guy before, and this is maybe over a year ago. Like before he really started doing any social mm-hmm. media stuff, Jack told me to send him a DM, and I didn't. He immediately got back to me. And wow. we said, like, hey, if you'd like to come on the podcast, let me know. And he responded back, like, almost immediately. Yeah, man, I'm down. Let me know when you're thinking. Um, oh, oh, and then he responded back, I'm not sure when I'm going to be in the U.S., but I could keep you posted, like, something mm-hmm. like that. And I didn't think anything of it. But, uh, but yeah, that was when he still had his Instagram. Like, mm. long oh, a long time ago. Yeah, maybe one day. So you want to go to Romania for him? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a big trip. Oh, yeah. It's a big trip. Um, so at this point... You know, I'd probably rather like go to Japan and do like personal trips like that if mm. I'm going to go to that extent. But I mean, maybe. Okay. 
I saw you had uh, his boy on, Just, Justin Weller. So you don't he have like so a, nice. you don't have a moral dilemma with having like Tate on. It's not nothing like that. I would say I don't have a moral di- like I've listened to his videos and I think mm-hmm. a lot of what he says is accurate. I think some of what he says is way too extreme for me. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. Like for me, I kind of pick and choose what I see in people, and I think most people have something you could learn from, even if you don't like the person. Mm-hmm. So. The way I kind of approach anybody on social media, I'm like, this makes sense. This doesn't. I like this part. I don't like that part. So I'm going to use like these parts that I think are productive for me. I'm going to go with it. And then I'm going to ignore everything else. But I think too many people to see everything is like, okay, that's fact because he he Mm -hmm. said this. And this applies to anybody, by the way. So I think critical thinking is something that's probably lacking in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And they would be much better off being skeptical about everything doing their own research, and then picking and choosing the bits and pieces that they like. I think it's the same thing. Like, we had a lot of political guests on the Ice Coffee Mm -hmm. Hour, people on the far right and people on the far left. And between both of them, there are people and points that I agree with on both sides. So I I don't like it to be one or the other. But who are you voting for? (laughs) You. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I'll take it. Who, Who was kind of like the most impactful guests you've had on personally not like views wise just they've had the biggest impact on you Hormo- Out, outside of yeah. myself of yeah. course outside of you hormozy yeah. was a really good one yeah. uh the one who's had the biggest personal impact on me i would say is healthy gamer gg now uh, dr k mm-hmm. um he was the most insightful he had me captivated every moment I really resonate with what he has to say. He's very deep, very introspective. Got me thinking about a lot of things I've never thought about before. Like, I'll give you an example. We had a really great discussion off camera. And I was telling him my issues with, like, feeling uneasy, feeling anxious about things, and always try to fix things. Because Mm -hmm. my thing has always been thinking very logically. If there's a problem, there is a solution. And so because there's a solution, I'm going to spend all my time thinking about how to fix things. And he's explained that that's worked really well in my life so far because anytime I get to a roadblock or a problem, fix it, fix mm-hmm. it, fix it. But I've not had any experience sitting in being uncomfortable or feeling uncomfortable. And that's a muscle he says that I need to work on is just accepting that there are things outside of your control that you cannot fix and you need to learn to get, feel, you know, okay with just sitting in that uncomfortableness and accepting it. And that was something I never thought of before. I never experienced before. And he's, he's right. I don't. Like, if, if I feel uncomfortable about something, I'll immediately fix it. Mm. So I don't know how to not be uncomfortable. How about physically? You, you tap in with the cold plunge? No. Yeah, <laughs> I, can't, I can't stand it. No, my shower, dude, my shower needs to be like almost all the way really? up, but not too hot, though. <laughs> The spa needs to be exactly at 99 okay. degrees. If it's 100, I heat up way too fast. If it's 98, I'm cold. Okay. Exactly 99. Wow. So you don't tap in with any, you know, grounding, any any health, biohacking? Not really. No? No. I try to get, go to the gym every day. Like, okay. my, my whole thing is I try to go to the gym every day. I try my best to get eight hours of sleep. Uh, and I try to eat healthy. And so that includes little to no alcohol, little to no desserts, and just not processed foods. And if I do, it's it's very sparingly. No red 40? What's that? You're not red 40 maxing? What's red 40? <laughs> I don't know. No, you got to hop on the new uh, uh, finance wait. YouTube wave. What is, what is a red 40? You it, gotta it's like, like the, dyes in the food. They like cause ADHD food. apparently and whatnot. So. Oh, red dye number 40. <laughs> yes. Uh, what are they calling that? Red 40s? Maxing? Maxing? That's, <laughs> That's what, what I'm he's doing. going, going yeah, for. Because Max is on this, oh, I'm not doing red 40. Yeah. Uh, just, he, and he's red 40 max. Yeah, and I'm everything that has red 40, he's just indulging <laughs> what's wrong with the red dye number 40 Appa- i don't I'm, again i'm not an expert this is luke luke belmar changed me <laughs> okay uh no tap water no red 40 the tap water what yeah that's all i drink is tap water no bro way. yeah no no why no, don't no, you drink no, tap no. Water? are you serious <laughs> I maybe in vegas it's I, better or something i don't, I don't believe that it's just, dude, dude apparently where, where's the nearest lake or spring in vegas well i guess they do have some yeah you have the lake not like las vegas uh jack what's the lake i forget what lake mead yeah, tap water apparently filled with estrogen. Mm. So and they don't filter for it. So you gotta you gotta switch <laughs> over to spring water, brother. It's explaining a lot. Now. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> it all makes sense. No, no, I don't know. I mean, yeah, listen, you could be right. I've done no research on this. I've just I drink tap water and maybe 
people are going to comment, be like, oh, that explains so much. <laughs> That's why Grim is it. And I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Spring water is nice, though. I think it also just tastes better. Like, it's, I, I don't like when I pour a glass of tap water and it's all murky and I see, like, there's usually air bubbles. Yeah. I, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, I hadn't used a, a property in LA in a very long time, mm-hmm. or it hadn't been used. And we fill up the water and it's all cloudy. Mm. And, uh, Macy was looking at this and she was like, this is, this is horrible water. Like we, I don't want to shower with this. And it looked really bad. And mm-hmm. I was like, no, it's air bubbles. So you just left it for 20 minutes, came back, crystal clear water, just air. So a lot of the time you see that it's not dirty. It's just air bubbles yeah. that are I mean, really I- fine. <laughs> and it's pushing at the pipes and. No, that's actually the estrogen. Could <laughs> and it, it kind of airs could be, out. Could be yeah. the antidepressants in there. Yeah. Yeah. The hormones. People flush the pills, man. <laughs> <laughs> Who's flushing birth control down the. No, apparently when you take yeah. a pill, it most of it comes out through your urine. So that's the, again, bro, it this is not my science. Though. It makes sense. I haven't done enough research. All I did was hop on a podcast with somebody <laughs> and they told me that's what it is. See, so. here's the thing. There's so much <laughs> misinformation that's going around. I bet like, because I've seen TikToks like that and they claim that like, that's why certain fish are like coming up with different characteristics. I don't know if it's true or it's not. It's why the frogs are gay. It's, yeah. Dude, I have no clue. <laughs> I have no clue. I, I'm going to have to research this Okay. and I'll get back to you. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to put in a filter, you know? I mean, I have a Brita. So, you know, that kind of, but it's all from the tap. Yeah, I don't think a listen. I don't think a Brita is taking out like hormones in the water. I think it's probably just a very basic carbon filter. It's probably all it is. So it's removing some stuff, but not a lot. All right, Luke, send Grandma a reverse osmosis filter. <laughs> I have, one. but it's for the aquarium. Reverse osmosis. <laughs> yeah, RDI. The, so the fish are drinking better water than <laughs> yeah, you, bro. The fish have to drink zero TDS water. <laughs> okay. Like if the TDS goes even like three. What is TDS? I don't know what stands. <laughs> well, I just know it's TDS. Okay. Oh, this bro science. I, I love yeah, it. <laughs> for the aquarium, I just know like, hey, anything above zero is bad for the aquarium. So if I get like a, a two, it's time to change the filters. Mm. Yeah, back to the podcast talk. I'm really curious about that because you know we are just starting this out. This yeah. is what seventh episode. Um, do you get nervous for guests? No, um, there were a few that I was anxious about. Ben Shapiro was one mm, of them okay. because I knew that I'm never going to win an argument in, with him. And he's so sharp and he's so on it. And we took a, a red eye flight to get there. So we got no sleep. And he was coming at 10 a.m. We arrived at like six o'clock in the morning and just hyped up on coffee and like made it through the episode. He, I was nervous for. Uh, Ty Lopez, for me, I was nervous mm. just because I'd seen him since like 2014. And for me, like he was who I kind of looked at when I was making content because he was making all these videos. And they were doing the best on YouTube when I was starting. So for me, it was kind of like a full circle moment to be Mm -hmm. like, this is the person I kind of saw making content that proved it was possible to make content. Was he actually getting good views though? Because I feel like a lot of it was paid views, no? I think any views back then were good for finance. Like back then you're getting 5,000 views on a finance topic. That was like amazing because that category didn't even exist. Uh, Grant Cardone, I was a little nervous about too, but he was so nice. Um. I would say no. Ben Shapiro definitely was the one I was the most nervous about. But overall, it's just kind of like, oh, another podcast. Yeah. Well, I'd say for the most part. I hope, it, I hope it, to get there one day. Yeah. It, it <laughs> helps that, you know, we we control the pace of it. So like mm-hmm. the podcast is only as good as our questions and what we say and what we plan. So yeah. you could mitigate a lot of those things, just being prepared ahead of time and planning out well. I'm, you know what? I'm actually more nervous about the cameras not working or, or okay. the audio cutting out. Like that, that's what scares me the most. Do you get nervous coming onto people's podcasts? Um, n- sometimes. Sometimes I do because it's a little more unexpected. I mm. like being in control of like mm. the pacing, the questions, the direction. So I prefer that, but yeah. I feel you on that. Yeah, I mean, we're nonchalant, so I feel like it's pretty easy. You guys are a little federal. Yeah. You, know, you guys ask crazy <laughs> questions. And... <laughs> the official podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so I could see being nervous to hop on that. Um, but I mean, that's kind of, um, that's the podcast questions. You're actually getting married soon. Yeah. Right? When is that? June. June. Yeah. Uh, how'd you guys meet? She sent me a message on Instagram. Okay. And initially, didn't think anything of it. So like, I would go on Instagram and just respond to people. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, select any like one or the other i would just go and respond to messages that were either funny 
messages that I thought were inquisitive, asked a really good question. And so I would do this like every night. It's just mm -hmm. go answer questions. She responded to a story of mine with something just like really funny. And I was like, oh, this is funny. I'm going to respond to it. And I just responded like a really like a horrible message. Like she sent me like a, a sentence or two. Mm -hmm. And then I just said something like facts. <laughs> one. <laughs> w -Riz? That was it. W that was a one message. But then she responded back something else that was like a good question or it was uh, again funny. And we just started a conversation from that. And she was also local. Mm. So okay. um, then I think a few weeks later, we decided to meet up and just instantly hit it off. What was the first date? Uh, sushi. Sushi. Happy okay. hour sushi. There wow. you go. Yeah. And my my biggest question about your relationship mm -hmm. would be, why did you decide to go public with it? Um, I had never been public with anything in the past. And usually I've been really against it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it just, it felt right to go public with it. It, it really wasn't much more than just like a feeling. Mm -hmm. But in the past, yeah, I've definitely been very private about it because I didn't want to like mix up relationships with social media and you just see like all the horror stories on it and it it always seems to like a lot of the social media relationships like aren't that happy behind the scenes and they mm -hmm. like put out this amazing image of look, look how great we are and the behind the scenes is like the relationship is in shambles can you drop some names <laughs> bro the ace family oh, ace oh yeah family yeah the, the, the ace yeah. family the ace yeah. family yeah. Uh, but, what was the other one prank versus prank oh yeah there's another one something like that but do you regret oh, yeah. going public I don't regret it, but I think in hindsight, I should have been a lot more cautious. Mm. And the thing that I really didn't like and wasn't prepared for was like, I thought I would come on and we didn't really announce this mm -hmm. relationship. It was just like, I think she was introduced because we did a reaction together on my second channel. Mm -hmm. And 95% um, of it was extremely positive, like very positive. But that 5% is just is going to hate for no reason. And they're going to make assumptions. And I hated putting her in that position that I don't think like you can't prepare anyone for that. Of just like, hey, the episode is going to get 200,000 views, but 5% of people are really going to dislike you. And that's 10,000 people. So uh, good luck. It's like that takes so much mental fortitude that you have to like work up to. And so for me in the beginning, I remember like when I was making YouTube videos, I would get sometimes 100 views, but get one negative comment and that mm -hmm. would ruin my day. But just over years, it's just like, okay, one negative comment, five negative comments, 10 negative comments. And keep in mind, like 10 negative comments out of like a thousand. Uh, but still those mm -hmm. negative comments would affect me. But imagine someone who's has no social media, yeah. very private on everything, all of a sudden exposing them to a large audience who's very opinionated. And that 1% mm -hmm. is like really loud. Um, I would say it was a huge adjustment and I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So I think I, I probably should have been more cautious, but I was also, I didn't think that much into it, mm -hmm. but yeah, I should have been probably a little more cautious just because it's like, do I really want to, you know, like what's the benefit if that makes sense? Yeah. Like you're excited to share, you know, a person on the internet who you're, you know, in love with, mm -hmm. but it just opens it up to just like random people's opinions that like don't serve anything. Now, again, overwhelmingly it's positive, but even that 1%, even if it's a 10th of 1%, it's like mm -hmm. when you get that many views, it's, it's still a lot of people. And I don't think it's healthy to have to subject your relationship to that. Yeah. When it comes to hate comments, I always think that if one person commented, like at least 50 thought it because <laughs> if you do the math of like how many people comment yeah, versus the yeah. views and same for the positive I, I, ones here's the thing i think you're discounting how few people comment and how many people are truly indifferent i mean there are so many things that i uh, that i see and i just don't care <laughs> so it's like so the people that comment have to care to such a degree mm -hmm. to want to leave a comment about something like even even before making YouTube videos, when I was like obsessed with certain channels, I would never comment. I just really liked the, the channel. So I think there's there's 90% of people out that just don't care. And so to your point of like the people who think that just don't want to say anything, I think that's such a small percentage because most people are not that. And the people that comment feel very strongly because they are just really out there. Are you still reading all comments? Most of them. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's probably not healthy. <laughs> Do you recommend uh, it? I do. 
Really? Uh, I do. Uh, yeah, you just have to build up a really thick skin. Yeah, how are you I'm, feeling? I'm trying to avoid that. I'm just... <laughs> uh, when it's a really long one yeah. and I see my name, I just scroll past it. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. I, I kind of like see it as ripping off a Band-Aid where... Mm. It dep- I guess it depends on the... Con- a lot of times I see it as like helpful criticism. If there's something... Like you could tell the difference between hate and like, hey, Graham, I've noticed you doing this. I don't like this. I think you should change this. And here's why. Then I could say like, okay, this person is coming from a healthy place. I could take this criticism, see how I can incorporate that in future mm-hmm. videos and come away with something that's a positive outcome. If it's like, you suck, Graham. You're the worst. I've learned there's there's no convincing. I could respond back with facts and just everything and they'll know you're only backpedaling you will you, just the fact that you acknowledge this means that you're awful so it's like there's no winning do so, you ever respond sometimes that's yeah. crazy. sometimes I've, i do I've but res- I, now i respond to mostly positive comments okay. but there are there are a few that i see where it's like oh, i respond but what? it doesn't help. I'll acknowledge it it doesn't make the situation any better. It, it's like it makes you, it worth cuz you're giving them that attention. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when when I just started like I didn't want like I'd see a hate comment or like something that I want to respond to and I type out like this whole paragraph and then I just delete it. And just to get my thoughts out, that was my coping. But sometimes it's interesting because I've done that and I've written out the whole comment and then the comment then that person responds. Oh no, man, I was just joking around. Like I didn't actually mean it. Love your stuff. Mm. And th- those feel good. <laughs> Cause it feels like, all right, you know, you won that one. I won that one. All right, fine. <laughs> but the ones where they doubled down, mm. it's just like, it's like, what, what was the point of that? So we're already married. You're approaching marriage. Do you have any advice for TJ? He's the only single one uh, here. Yeah, like relationship advice or cold Dude, you, approach. You're the married ones. I, I mean, like, I feel like you would have better advice than I would. We're but, already married. You yeah, know, it's like, like we're past of, that. Out of the gate, you had to do the, the rizzing recently, so yeah. and you have the cold approach method for the podcast. Do you have that for? romantic relationships it's been such a long time like i feel like it's out there like i'm i'm telling jack about like my experiences with tinder like a decade ago mm. and apparently all of those things are like outdated now it's like the <laughs> really? whole thing the whole thing has changed and people are like no that doesn't work no more and this and that. what'd so, you do like what'd you do in the past gosh it what was i talked about it before but i made like a fake super like on my profile so it came up mm. like blue and it made it look like Everyone that I was recommended to, I had super liked them. And usually super likes, you only get like one a day and, okay. or you had to pay for more and you only get like five. But like for me, it was like everybody got super liked. Okay. Uh, and it was this hack and it got me like 100, 200 matches like pretty quickly. The, the and then it got raised. shut down. <laughs> and then they removed the the picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's too hard. So I don't know what it, I, I don't know what it's like now. I would say my, my only advice is just practice and just what do you mean by practice just hang around women could we practice right oh, yeah, now? Could he cold approach you y- yeah sure <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't know if you're giving your best shot cold approach, cold approach to Graham. okay i see you i see you in, in a coffee shop <laughs> hey, hey what's your name stefan St- oh, oh stephanie stephanie. <laughs> stephanie uh i got i got money <laughs> i got money i got a beamer <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just i'm working right now can I get your number? No. Bro. <laughs> Nightmare cold. It's <laughs> all Weather up being crazy. Right? <laughs> it's not even loaded up. We're not getting no females. We're not getting no yeah. podcast guests. Can we do a reverse? Oh, yeah. R- Riz me up. Okay, so now, now I'm the girl. What's your name? Uh, Melanie. Why? What? I was... Uh, okay, okay. Just ask it, ask it again. My fault. What's the setting, though? <sighs> Gosh, I don't even know. You you come up with a setting okay, and I'll start right. improvise. This is we're, terrible. We're right outside the sphere. We're gonna go see it tonight, whatever. Uh and you run into Melanie right here. <laughs> but you don't know she's Melanie. You don't, you don't know my name. Yeah, you don't know. Oh yeah, you don't know the name. We're you just, you just the see a, attractive. The emoji's young female. on. The emoji's on the sphere. It's not an ad right now. <laughs> it's not an ad. It's, it's not an emoji. Ad. Gosh, what would I say? See, I'd probably spend too long thinking about what to say, and then she'll walk off. I'll be like, "Damn, no, she's, she's a, taking selfies." She's, she's, she's gonna be she's there for a minute. She's taking selfies. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. Do you want me to take a picture of you? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> What's the photo for? Uh, it's for my friend, for my friends. Yeah, family back home. And you don't want me to? Why don't you want me to take a photo? <laughs> why is self like the selfie's not gonna look that good? <laughs> All right, fine. All right, cool. What's your name? Uh, Melanie. Where are you from? 
Chicago. Oh, nice. What brings you to Vegas? I'm, I'm just, I'm here for the, for the food. Some nice <laughs> restaurants here. What have you been to so far? Nowhere. I just landed. You just landed? Yeah. <laughs> have you heard of JSX? <laughs> heard of what? JSX. Never heard of that. Oh, it's a great, it's a great airline. <laughs> Well, listen, uh, obviously my pickup line <laughs> hasn't worked, but uh, maybe I could think of something better to say if you give me your number. Mm. Mm. That's Riz. Um, That's... Yeah, sure. All right. Wow. That's All a right, lesson. Wow. That's By the way, he's underage, so. <laughs> oh, that's he's getting canceled. <laughs> By the way, no, uh, yeah. 14. <laughs> No, I'm trolling. You're 18. So it's, Gosh, he's 18. He's all good. You should have specified the age. <laughs> you didn't ask for the age, brother. <laughs> oh, no. We might have to cut that last uh, part. God, that took a weird turn. All right. um, well, I what, are you, my what are your red flags? Red flags? In a, in a girl. Oh, gosh. Um, I would say on her phone a lot. That, okay, so like I'm, I'm going back to when I was like dating people. Um, when was this? Like, what, at what age? Gosh. I guess starting from the age of like 20 for me, like the, the immediate ones where I was like an instant. No is just constantly on their phone. Uh, showing up late was like, I hated that showing up late, uh, talking about an ex Mm -hmm. gossiping, um, and just talking nonstop where it was like, not a conversation. It was just like a one side and I'm supposed to sit there and just not. So I guess there's five things, Mm -hmm. but yeah, showing up late, phone and gossip were like or not gossip talking about an ex or like the, the most immediate just i'm not interested so if you ever saw a girl just like sitting you would actually go and cold approach her i've done it before mm. um you got balls bro <laughs> <laughs> i i think it's just something everyone has to do yeah. but i was also used to that as like working in real estate because oh, yeah. everyone that comes into an open house like you have to go and talk to them mm-hmm. um and you could just kind of sense the people who didn't want to talk to you and the people who are receptive. And someone comes in open house. Hi, my name is Graham. Thanks so much for coming by. Here's a sheet with all the information. Five bedrooms, two million bucks. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Some people just do not want to be talked to. So I just hand in the sheet. And so I feel like it's the same thing with approaching anybody. Mm-hmm. You get the vibes within like 20 yeah. seconds. Are they receptive or not? And if they're not, it's not like being persistent and creepy and just like, talking when they're obviously disinterested did you ever have trouble with it like did you ever have to hop on youtube and search up how to cold approach females alpha m videos yeah alpha m videos <laughs> i i used to love watching simple pickup simple pickup okay. do you see this kong fam you you met kong you met kong last night actually you met kong? him last night he was there kong really? fam mm. he he started simple pickup in like 2010 Okay, is that okay. the one, the fake pranks one, or no? No, they weren't fake pranks. No, they used to do challenges between all the guys. And oh, when they're on the phone and stuff? Kinda. Okay. You know, but they used to have a challenge, like uh, picking up a girl saying a certain word, hmm. picking up a girl dressed as a nerd, picking up a girl okay. dressed as a jock, picking up a girl wearing costumes, and they would just go up and have a great time. And I think at the end of the day, it's just about feeling at ease in who you are and just having a good time and not like being so dependent on a certain outcome it's like going up and just like you're you're more there to express yourself than you are to like oh, i'm gonna try to get a number or something like mm-hmm. that are you okay with rejection um i would say no but well, do you handle it okay better. yeah okay yeah usually i i think the biggest thing is i don't take rejection personally like i wouldn't look at a rejection as like Something with me, I would see it as something that I did wrong and something I could improve. So, like, let's just say I'd walk up to a group of people and they're just not interested in talking to me whatsoever. I don't, I'm not like, oh, they hate me. They couldn't stand me. It's because of this and this and this. So, I'd look at that situation and I would just think to myself, was I confident? How did I feel in the moment? Um, was I too nervous? Did I give off weird vibes? And I'd like go th- kind of through this mental checklist and think, how could I do this better in the future? And where did I go wrong? But I wouldn't. And thirty percent of the time, it's just the wrong situation. It's just mm-hmm. like they yeah. don't—they're not receptive to it. There's nothing I could have said or have done or acted that would have made a difference, and that's okay. That's usually the biggest fear, though. Like when you're approaching a girl or somebody in business, it's like fear of rejection. So, you know, you have to overcome that, TJ. 
oh, bro, I've already o- overcome that. <laughs> Did you see what happened here, bro? He's good. I guess. He's good. Bro, that, <laughs> that was, that was not really that was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you think something like simple pickup can work today with like the current climate? Yeah, it's really? it's. I think it's just human nature. Oh, are you talking about, well, we're talking like cancel culture and stuff like yeah. that? Yeah. Oh. As far as the content? Jeez. Yeah. But it's it's swinging back, I think. I don't know. It's it it's it seems like it's pretty frowned upon, mm. um, and I think the the mindset is that you're you're making content at the expense of someone else, even if they're like you know having a great time to like to get that one person who's having a great time on camera. You're probably going through ten people who just don't want to be bothered, and that's Makes fine. Sense. So I could see I could see the perspective of like, hey, we've kind of moved on from that, but. Um, you know, I, I don't like to think that times have changed and like we can't do the things that we all used to do. And but, you know, I don't know. It, it could probably be done, but you would have to be a lot safer mm. and strategic about how you went and how you did that. Yeah, that's fair. But speaking of YouTube shows, I remember I think I had this conversation with you, maybe even on that first podcast. Yeah. Where you told me you want to start a show where you would have people come in. Yeah, and you would audit their finances. Did I? Did I actually say that? I believe so. Like you wanted to be like a Judge Judy, but for finances. Oh, I did say that. And now we have Caleb, Caleb Hammer. Hammer, who does that, and he's had massive success with it. I know. Do you feel some type of way about that? No, I don't. Um, probably in hindsight, it would have been a good pivot, mm-hmm. but I don't. I, th- I think I'm happy where I'm at now. Um, my my one thing I sh- I should have probably evolved more as a creator, and I didn't do that. So that's on me, but Caleb has dominated that in such a great way that he's carved out his own niche Mm -hmm. and there's no one that's going to be able to compete with him the way he's doing. Do you think he got it from you though? What do you mean got? Do you think he heard that and executed on it? Probably not. I mean, even if he did, Mm -hmm. good on him for taking that. I mean, he's putting in the word. The thing is he put his own spin on things. Like even if you hear that, it's like auditing financials. Because I kind of think when I hear auditing financials, I think of that like, and these shows have been going on for a long time, the money makeover shows where they would go to someone's house, they'd show around the house. This has been going on since the 90s. So what Mm. Caleb is doing is not like this one-off thing that no one's ever done before. He's doing it though in a setting where they come in and get roasted and people watch, I believe, for Caleb in the situations and they love Caleb's personality and they love the way he does it. You could put someone else in the exact same show and they will not do as well because they're not Caleb. Mm. And so he has a personality that shines when it comes to that sort of content and you could tell how into it he gets. So even if you take the idea, which I'm not saying he is, but even if he did, it's like Mm -hmm. he is so one of a kind that no one is able to compete with him on, on his level. That's fair. How do you plan on evolving your content, though? I don't know if I care to, to be really? honest. No, I'm, I I don't care. You're just going to write it out? Could be. Or I just stop. But or but the podcast is something that, that I will mm. continue to double down on. Like, for me, the podcast is like that North Star. For me, that's everything. That's, that's what I look forward to the mm-hmm. most. Anything else, I mean, I've probably, you know, I don't know how long the lifespan is on on that i'll probably continue making content but i don't know like you kind of gave up your your main show you haven't posted in like seven months i don't want to say you gave up i don't want to admit that just yet but <laughs> yeah i mean it's a similar thing i'm th- this podcast is also my north star yeah. it's, it's such a sustainable enjoyable form of content and if people enjoy it why not yeah. why did you decide to stop posting i was just kind of really tired of like milking the same concept and the same ideas yeah so I think if I were to have like a really good idea, I'm not against on executing and making like a good piece of content, but I just, I don't really want to be in that weekly hamster wheel of, oh, I have to create a dropshipping challenge every single week. I have to do this and that. And it's probably also a little bit of burnout. And I also wanted to focus on my e-commerce business. Um, just cause that's like an area that was always on the back of my mind. Like this is something that I want to explore. And I feel like YouTube isn't allowing me to do so. So I have like a vision of, a different life I could be living and I'm not doing that with YouTube so I at least want to experience that a little bit was that scary for you to do uh no because I did at a point where like I was comfortable enough financially to where it's not the end of the world if like YouTube stops yeah but I feel like it's also in part your identity where we know you through YouTube and so when you give that up are you worried about people mm. not knowing you or not being able to relate to you anymore? 
Now, I try not to tie up my identity in like the YouTube and like the money because I mean, that can be taken away in an instant. Yeah. Where do you stand on that? Like spiritually, do you believe in a in a God? In a I do. Afterlife? I believe I believe there's a God, but I don't subscribe to like it has to be like Christianity or mm -hmm. Judaism or like I tend to think that there's something out there, but I don't like when we're talking about picking and choosing things that I believe in. I I see things in certain religions that I'm like I agree with that. I think that's mm -hmm. fantastic. And I see other things. I'm like that makes no sense. I don't understand that. Why Why does that have to come with this? Mm -hmm. So for me, I would say if anything, I relate the most probably buddhism mm. i believe there's got to be some sort of creator out there. there there has to be something bigger than than us does buddhism have a creator i believe they have just a lot of different gods and and mm. spirituality I, I would say the spirituality aspect to me is the most important do you explore it like is that one thing you want to grow on and and mature in maybe one day okay yeah so but if you believe that there's like a god mm -hmm. Wouldn't that become the most important thing in your life? Like there's a creator out there. Wouldn't you want to pursue that and explore that avenue? If we just do good, just treat people with kindness and respect. And I believe in karma and treating people how you want to be treated. And I don't know why there's there's more than just being a uh, trying to be a good person and improving on yourself every day and trying to be a good role model for those around you and, and be kind. Is there an afterlife? I'd love to believe so. I, if my, what I'd love to, okay, so I believe that there's got to be an afterlife and some sort of reincarnation. Like my dream would be that you would be e able to either, I don't want to say like level up in life, like come back as, but I know I'm jumbled with my words. It would, it would be very neat if you could have different experiences and like, I need to learn something in this life. And so I'm going to learn it here. And then in another lifetime, I could learn something else and different perspective and just gain wisdom over time as a soul or be able to come back as, you know, as an animal or as an ant or a cat or a dog. Like, whatever. who would you want to come back as? <laughs> I think it would be cool to live life of like friends and family. I think it'd be very cool to come back and like be because it. If we could, if if time is infinite and and we only see timeline on a spectrum because that's just what our minds could perceive, then there's nothing saying that I couldn't come. I know this sounds crazy, but there's nothing that says like I couldn't come back as you in mm. another lifetime and live your life. And then and then you get into like is that is your life predetermined and is everything already going to happen because we're set in motion in this certain way? So I don't know, but like I like to believe that there's an infinite amount of lives that we could live. Fair. I don't know if I subscribe to that, but you know, that's fair. Yeah, to each their own. I mean, it's. I think it's good to explore it because you know everything we have on this earth is just stuff. You know, and I feel like people that are the most wise, they're always reaching out for something greater than that. You know, you can have all the cars and all the money and whatnot, but I, I, like you, I, I I hope to. I believe that there's something else because yeah. it'd be be kind of a waste if there wasn't. Yeah, I don't believe so, it's just black. Yeah. So and and just nothingness. I I don't believe in that. All right, so like, how were you as as a teenager in high school? Teenager in high school, um, hated I hated school. Was not a good student. Did not care to go to classes. All I wanted to do, well, it depends like what age, but like, uh, like fourteen, fifteen. All I wanted to do was work at the aquarium, and that was it. And uh, I had a job at this marine aquarium wholesaler, and all I wanted to do was Why? just, I loved it. Okay. It's just what I was loved. it for money or just you like? No, it? I just loved it. You just like I it. just loved it. Yeah, um, you know, I started getting paid like later on, but like in the beginning, I would just work for free fish and coral. Like wow. I cared more about like working a whole week and saving up for a really cool fish than I did money. It was I just loved it. So, what was your mindset like? Was your mindset always like, oh, hustle, get rich, or did you kind of snap into that? A little bit no i i just i had a feeling that i was going to be successful at anything that i did and i just i just had this unwavering confidence that whatever i set my mind to i'm going to do well at it so i was not nervous like back then it's like oh what am i going to do and i'm going to college i just i was obsessed with fish and coral and i just knew that that was going to be my way of just i've always just loved doing what i do and if i don't love something i stop doing it so that's been my focus usually
How do you feel about this new wave of like super young entrepreneurs? Like I'm see, I'm scrolling IG Reels. I'm seeing 13 year olds like talking about, oh, I'm in monk mode. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm doing this and that. Do you think that kind of robs them of their childhood? Because you don't seem like you were like that growing up. Um, I read a lot of like good self help books though, but I think it's, I was like that though. For me, it was just work, but we didn't call it anything. It would like now you have all these names for for things, and you see these trends and hopping like. Then we didn't have, like, the trends were more so, like, your social group and what you guys were into at school. So, for me, it was just, like, I loved working, and then I'd go home and talk about fish and coral online. So, yeah. you could call that, like, a monk mode. But, like, but that's, like, a know? hobby, you know? You have your group yeah. of friends, you you enjoy fish or whatever, but, like, these kids are just on their computer dropshipping, you know? They're like, hey, I can't hang out with my friends because... You know how much better that is than them <laughs> going and, like, doing weed getting drunk with their friends, like scrolling TikTok. Are they missing out on video games, sports, relationships, talking with friends, talking with females, you know? (laughs) They could do that at any point. Yeah. Okay. At any point. If they decide they're not enjoying something, I don't have to, like, I don't think these, it's parents, like, you need to be in monk mode. Like, the kids (laughs) find it. Like, I, if, if, like, one day, I hope to be a parent and I, I, I will always encourage whatever they want to pursue within uh, within reason of course but like if they have a passion for something i want to explore that i think a lot of people have talents that they just get shoved down that parents never want to encourage and it could be comedy it could be acting it could be music um they could be really into writing it doesn't matter but like i think everyone is born with a natural talent and it's up to parents to really encourage that so if, if it's monk mode they want to be drop shippers they want to do business i mean I I, th- I would be lucky to have a kid who's like really thinking of that sort of stuff. That's an interesting take. Yeah. Okay. So why are you why are you against paying your employees? Gosh, <laughs> we're gonna go there. <laughs> Everything is so taken out of context. You know, someone <laughs> someone sent me a link of Jack saying that he made ten thousand dollars his first year working for me, and people are like, Graham only paid Jack ten thousand dollars for the whole year, and they're taking this clip really. And Jack's over here. They're taking this clip so out of context. This was a year where Jack would drive down to my house every week to every other week. You want us to sit? Yeah, you. I'm like, <laughs> Let me get you right, Graham. You got you to a little low. Okay, I got to get low. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Graham offered to pay me. And I've mentioned this. When I say that I like got paid nothing in the beginning and then very little for that first year, he offered to pay me more. I said no because I wanted to establish more partner-like relationship. And uh, people were upset that he didn't pay me very much. And then- If I earn a lot more, people are upset I'm earning a lot. So it's Mm -hmm. like, the point here is you can't please everybody. No. Okay. So you want me to justify it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was (laughs) coming in once a week to once every, uh, you were coming in once a week to once every other week. And you were, you were going through my emails and you were picking out guests to have on the Graham Stephan show. And you were lining them up for the channel that I would film. And then I'd upload them to Dropbox. Yeah. I mean, like I Okay, so what are you trying to justify here? So it's a full time job. People, is what you're okay, saying. no, no. Let's let let me get this right. Let me get this right. I was, and you said you were miserable back then. Like people are. I wasn't <laughs> miserable. People are taking your comment of you in the guest house when you're making over a hundred thousand a year. They were taking your comment when you said you were miserable and pinning that to the ten thousand dollars. Oh no, no, no! I was very happy with the amount of money I was making, but I was miserable for other circumstances. It had no correlation yeah. whatsoever to the amount of money. But during the time you were miserable, you were making over six figures. Yeah, for sure. And I was super happy when I was making like no money at all. And also, like like I said, he offered to pay me more, but I denied it. That's that's on my that's on me. So. Sounds like an L. Yeah, I mean, no, I was <laughs> super happy with the decision that that I made to yeah. to earn nothing. And now you have fifty percent of ice coffee. <laughs> and, now, hour. and now it all worked out. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. The type of people that are going to be upset at, I think I was like 19 at the time, Mm -hmm. a 19 year old kid who's a student working at a restaurant and then grinding with, you know, an online personality guy for not a lot of money. The type of people that think that's messed up, I think are probably not the type of people that are going to be successful at the end of the day. And I think that's just the way that it is. You got to like see what appears to be working for certain people. Things are a long run. You're not going to start making a bunch of money right out the gate. That's just the way that life works. Um, and I think that you got to look at the, the positive and why people are doing certain things and how they are years after they start doing those things. You know, what's also crazy is that, uh, I just remembered this. I was trying to pay people $20 an hour mm-hmm. to do the work that Jack was doing and I couldn't get anyone to do it. So I went through the office of the Oppenheim group and through friends 
and I'd say, hey, I got these Facebook emails. You just all you need to do is go through them at any point from home, anywhere in the world, at any time. Just go through Facebook, copy and paste these emails into a Word document and email it to me. That's it. And I offer twenty dollars an hour to like multiple people. And guess what happened? No one did it. At twenty bucks an hour, I'd go back a few days later. Hey, man, you get get a chance to do it? Just let me know how many hours you worked. Oh, no, man, no, I didn't have time. I didn't do it. <laughs> and this persisted for such a long time. I couldn't get anyone to do it at all. And this is basic work. Like You could do this while watching a, a show. Mm-hmm. It just copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. That's all it is. And then Jack emailed me at the time when that was going on. And he's like, I'm willing to do anything for you. And I'm like, hey, if, if you want to do this, this is what it is. And he did it overnight. And then took wow. him dinner afterwards. And that created the entire partnership. Now, I don't think the the hate is justified. That's like an internship. Like, are you going to be mad at people who decide they want to do an internship? Yeah, but it, then it I saw. Make sense. But then I saw other comments, and it bugs me. And this is like responding to the criticism I saw. Mm-hmm. There were two types of comments. One said, "I fired my editor after he bought a house in Las Vegas and moved here with his wife." Mm. Sounds and like he, a grand thing to do. <laughs> he, he it, but but there's so much nuance. He never bought a house. Okay. Um, I think they're confusing Alex with Jack. I also continued paying Alex until he had an even better job lined up. And the fact is, the only reason Alex and I aren't working together is because sometimes there was like a week at a time where I had nothing for him to do. Like Mm -hmm. there was nothing. And he was just like sitting there. And there, there, like I wasn't posting as much. So in the beginning, it was like, yeah, three videos a week is is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when it's like one video a week and... I'm out of town traveling for the podcast and I figured eh, I'm, I'm just going to edit myself. Mm-hmm. There's just not enough for him to do. And that, and that's all there was, but you know, and we, I still hang out with Alex all the time. So there's no big drama there. There's no drama. Can you make some up for a clip? <laughs> Please. I fired my yeah. editor, Alex, because stop scrolling. <laughs> I fired, I fired <laughs> Alex because he, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but, but no, but then there were other comments that yeah. Alex quit. Because it wasn't paying him enough. Mm. I'm like, but but what's funny is that people will say these things. And all of, everyone underneath is like, oh my gosh, I had no idea he did this. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like, it's a fact. And so when you have two comments that people believe, like one, Alex quit, and another, I fired Alex. It's like, but, but people just believe whatever someone it's comments. Just rumors. So it's like, there's so much nuance to it. And like, the fact is, Alex was paid well. I continued paying Alex. Mm-hmm. He lined something up that is amazing from something that he got from youtube well if we're addressing all the controversy no uh (laughs) not not all not all if we're addressing most of the controversy one thing that i keep on seeing i keep on seeing that's been said about you is that like i'll be watching a random video and they'll mention like fear-mongering thumbnails and they always put up a picture of you and when i like your thumbnails and when i thought about it there's a little bit of truth to that because I feel like those are the new headlines. If you think about a million viewed video, it's got a click through rate of, I don't know, 10, 8%. If you extrapolate that, 10 million people saw that headline, only a million clicked and saw the nuance. So they don't know that, you know, it's slightly clickbait. Do you feel like, do you have a moral dilemma with that? No, it's if, if they actually go and watch the video, they see I'm, I'm extremely neutral. Mm-hmm. So when I look at title and i agree i agree with so that's criticism to me that i look at and i say okay there is a point to that there's merit to that but i also look at do i want my message to reach as many people as possible and my message Mm -hmm. is never you should sell everything this is a bad like my message is never something that's negative or something that is like speculative like oh you should go and buy stocks now because stocks are low it's always a very balanced neutral approach based on historical evidence and facts and so much so that in the pinned comment of every single video i've I've been doing this now for about a year and a half i link to every single resource and exactly Mm -hmm. where i find everything that i say throughout the video so if there's something i say I back it up with facts. Here's the study. Here's what they said. Here's how we came to that conclusion. So if I want to maximize how many people are able to see a video and benefit from it, you have to do a title and thumbnail that people are more likely to click to. If I don't do that, the videos will receive about 30% of the views. Mm -hmm. They're going to get the same amount of impressions. So the impressions are, are pretty much always the same ratio based on impressions versus people clicking through. So that doesn't change. So it's not like, you know, people are just going to see a headline and then just... 
extrapolate from that. Even if they do, who's to say they don't watch the news? The news would be way worse. I mean, the news is extremely biased. Any website you see is probably going to have a bias as well. I, I really go out of my way to make sure there's not a bias and I'm pretty neutral and I share the pros and cons of everything. So I'd rather people see the pros and cons from someone who really, I don't have an agenda. There's there's not like I'm trying to like sell stocks or buy stocks, buy houses, don't sell. Like, I don't care. So for me, it's just like I'm passionate about talking about these topics and my goal is to have as many people as possible reach that message and hopefully, uh, you know, are, hopefully are into what I have to say. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of on them for not clicking, but and like seeing the full but, message. Yeah, but I get the criticism. And frankly, like I'm not like excited necessarily to make like fear. Sell, like, sell everything. <laughs> like I'm not sitting there. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> like personally, I wish it were the other way around. Mm -hmm. I would love to make positive titles. I would love to make like more uplifting titles. But consistently, every single time I do it, it receives a third of the views. So from a business perspective, it's just bad business. Mm -hmm. Why would you limit yourself to something like that? But at the same time, I acknowledge it. I agree with the criticism. And that's partly the reason. Like, I'm just kind of getting burnt out. Like, I'm, I'm not thrilled about making that sort of content. Mm -hmm. I f yeah, I feel like you're just, you're insanely neutral. Like, you're as neutral as it gets. Are yeah. there any things that, like, you just really stand for that, like, guide you? Really? I'm so, like... <laughs> indifferent and people sometimes are like oh you you know wavering and always right in the middle and not like that i am so indifferent on so many things and politics are like is a great example of it and i guess what people have really appreciated from the ice coffee hour is that we don't we're not argumentative with our guests and we and we listen and that's truly because i am so indifferent and there are little things here and there i'm like i agree with this i disagree with that i could listen to anybody and be totally okay with it. And just like, if I disagree, I'm not going to change their mind. It's not up to me to insert, hey, I disagree with it. Everyone believes something for a reason. What's that reason? I'd love to dig deeper on that. So with finance, it's the same thing. It's like, I don't I don't care either way. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I feel passionate about is like certain high yield savings accounts. If your money is earning zero. That's what guides you? <laughs> yeah. Is that if your money is earning zero, at least you should be earning something. If your credit card is a high interest rate, pay it. Like there's certain basic things that I feel strongly about, but most things I really, I don't want to say I don't care, but it's like, I'm just so neutral about it. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's, there's not much that like will get me triggered or anything. Do you think you're doing people a disservice by not, you know, if you're conflicted on something and this is what you believe, why not put people on, you know, be like, Hey, this is the right way. Might not be the right way. Who am I to say what's right and what's wrong? So people shouldn't listen to you? They should listen to everybody, <laughs> but I'm not, I should never be the deciding factor mm -hmm. for anything. You should listen to as many people as possible and then come to your own conclusion. I should not, you should not be like, oh, Graham believes this and therefore mm -hmm. I'm going to believe that too. That's, that's silly. You should listen to everything and say, based on what I've learned from these people and my own experiences, I believe this to be true. Even if people think, oh, they're wrong based on their experiences to them, it's right. And I think we have to acknowledge that based on everyone's perception of something, we're all going to have different perspectives on things. So to me, it's not a matter of like changing their mind or right or wrong. It's that's what they believe. And they're entitled to believe that I might not resonate with it, but that's not my place to say. Least controversial man alive. <laughs> I just don't care. I don't know why people care about certain things so much, you know, it, it's it, it or or to be able to look at something with a discerning point of view and and just understand that people have a different life experience mm -hmm. and we could be looking at the same thing and just both interpret that situation completely differently. I forget who is who we had on. It might have been a uh, healthy gamer, but talked about how everyone has like a different pair of glasses on and that are tinted from their own experience. So we could look at the same color, but we both see something different because we're wearing different glasses. And I believe that. Uh, but do you have any like hobbies that you're passionate about and just things that you're just really truly passionate about yeah aquariums as you can <laughs> tell i love aquariums and high yield savings accounts. yeah aquariums okay. uh music i love right. I, i've seen that story where you're playing the piano yeah you're going crazy yeah I play the piano drums uh lately i've been getting a little bit into art okay so like those kind of three really any sort of creative outlet and the podcast for me is something that so you're like a homebody you you want you like to stay home i do Okay. Yeah. If I if I didn't have to leave the house, I wouldn't. But the, wow. the downside with that is I forget how to socialize sometimes. So I could do really well on camera. But the podcast is good for that. 
it's different. It's on camera and you have like a structure and you're the one guiding the conversation and asking the questions. But you put me out of that and you take me into like a different setting. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten how to socialize. It's really That's actually bad. true. My wife lately has been yeah. like, she'll ask me a question and she'll be like, but can you give me a podcast answer? <laughs> so like I actually speak on certain things. Yeah. So it, it is very different. Yeah. Like with on camera talk versus um, IRL. Yeah. So I got to practice that. I got to go out a little bit more and socialize. But I'm t but the thing with me is I'm really bad at small talk mm. and topics I don't care about. Mm. And if you... If someone starts talking to me about something I'm just not interested in, I, I, it's hard for me to hide the way I feel and my disinterest. Mm. Or, or small talk for me, I just can't stand it. I just, what's the point of this? It's, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that and have to like, oh, this is a game that you have to play back and forth and a formality and you have to talk about this small talk to you know show that you're, it's like, I don't get it, but that's just me. You don't go out? You're, you're in Vegas. <sighs> no. No, I don't. I I don't like the strip. Do you like Vegas? I do. I love Vegas, <laughs> but I don't like the strip. But this, do you like your house or do I you love like the Vegas? House. I love the house. I love the area. I love Vegas. I just it, people hear Vegas and they think the Las Vegas Strip. They think gambling, drinking, clubs. I don't like any of that. Um. So what do you like about Vegas? I love the community. I love there's no traffic. Prices are cheap. Mm -hmm. Places are open really, really late. You're able to get more for your money. And there's a lot of great people around here that you could hang out with. So it's more about just the community. I would say so. So I really like the community. It could have been anywhere. If there was a strong community in Arizona, you would have chose Arizona? Vegas was nice because we it's an easy hub for both people to come to mm -hmm. who are traveling from around the country. And it's very easy. If we ever need to drive anywhere, it's just a quick drive. That makes sense. Do you yeah. ever plan on going back to LA? Probably not. I mean, five years ago, I never would have predicted I would have been here. Mm -hmm. I even made a video, which is so funny. In 20, early 2020, would I ever move to California? It was like, that was a video. The answer was like, no, never. I love it here. So I, I never could have predicted this. So I try not to think that, you know, that might be a never. Because mm -hmm. I, I just don't know. But probably but, not. But do you think somebody should move somewhere just because of the taxes? Like is I do. Really? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with it. <laughs> I think you need to you need to take into account what you are paying and what you're getting mm -hmm. in return. If you're paying for a service and you don't like the service and you have the ability to move, move. I don't know why you would be now. Here's the thing: if you if I loved California and mm -hmm. I said I love being here, but I could save money moving here, but I'm going to be miserable at this place, then I don't think it's worth it. But if you're going to be equally as happy, then I think it makes sense to move. If you're going to be more happy, it makes sense to move. But I think if you're if you feel like you're depriving yourself or you wouldn't have the full life experience, then probably not worth it. Yeah, that's kind of the calculation I ran. It was like, yeah, I could save 15, 13% if I move to Vegas. But if my quality of life goes down and I'm not as happy, maybe that'll impact my business negatively by like 50%. But how do you know your quality I, I of life is going to go down? You're well, I, I don't want to say quality of life, but like if I move out here and I'm all alone, I don't have like my community, my family. Dude, you'd love the community here. You saw the community last night. That's the community that we hang out with. Like, you know, once a week we see people. But He's I, a big family guy. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the people in here are either retirees or families. But it's not your family. <laughs> Do you want to hang out with my family? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can, <laughs> can hang you, out with me. Can you call your dad? <laughs> <laughs> you can just hang out here. I don't care. That's funny. Uh, no, but you don't. Do you know what I mean with that? Like, or you just don't. Uh, you, you you tend to treat your friends as family. Friends are, yeah, my yeah. friends are absolutely family. My family's family too. But I, I don't know, I've always had like a fairly close circle and to me, it, it feels like family. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. Do you have any brothers, sisters? I have a half sister who is older and she lives in California. Yeah, but she's way older. So I grew up like basically an only child. So okay. she's 17 years older than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the difference for us. It's like, you know, you have brothers, sisters back in Sacramento. I have little TJ. <laughs> you know, I think it's a family thing. Could we get into cars? Yeah, sure. Are you, you're a big car guy, right? Yeah. I mean, I see the Ford GT in the back. Yeah. Do What are you driving nowadays? A Tesla Model 3. The same one? <laughs> yeah, the same one. How many wow. miles is that? Uh, 30 something thousand miles. Oh, you yeah. don't drive, huh? <laughs> I would expect I, a lot more. No, no, no. Um, because there's nowhere to drive here. Like, I, I mostly stay home. So if I drive somewhere, it's usually within a 20 mile radius. We take it back. Uh, if we're, if we're going to spend like a weekend in LA or something like that every now and then we'll mm -hmm. just 
take the car. But no, I drive that most of the time. And Macy has her car too, so sometimes she'll drive. Are you planning on getting anything new? No, I don't new think words. so. I'm I'm kind of like set. I feel like for, well, for like car related stuff. I feel like like this. I don't drive, and it this to me was mostly like I think it's a good investment. Mm-hmm. I really love the car. I appreciate the car, but I get so much anxiety when I drive it, and I don't think that's how it should be when you could be on the wheel of a car. But I'm just like panicked, uh, and it's. It's also a car that's I don't I don't say dangerous to drive, mm-hmm. but unless you warm up the tires, if you gas it too much, the rear end slips out. If you take a turn too fast, the rear end slips out. You have to like drive this thing for 20, 30 minutes for the tires to really warm up if it's cold out mm-hmm. to like drive it safely. And then it's like the value of it. So I don't want something to happen to it. What did it cost you? Uh I paid three hundred for that car, which now it's worth more. But yeah, for me, I saw this as an investment. Like, first, of, it's not like a flashy. Let's drive it to the mm-hmm. dinner or something like that. It's like it, it's the car's an investment, and I could appreciate it. And I really love cars, so I could like it's it's an investment that I get to enjoy and drive. Do you ever just go sit in it? I like do this? actually. Yeah, wow. I do. Sometimes I take phone calls in there. Well, wow. it's a nice, quiet place. Cool. Just I close the door and I just you feel you feel good it's like being able to sit in a car like that is it to me it's still inspiring it's, it's, i'll take calls in there well it's nice i could see that yeah it's buying a three hundred thousand dollar car just to take calls in yeah. <laughs> it's a flex you know what people go and buy cars like this and they'll just go and drive them and it's their form of relaxation mm. for me i don't even need to drive the car to relax in it Fair enough. i could just sit in it and for me it's just like calm down it's quiet take a call did you get it on cars and bids uh no bring a trailer bring a trailer mm. Uh, do you plan on starting anything like that? Like Doug DeMera started Cars and Bids. He started like this full on huge business thanks to his personal brand. Do you have any plans for that? No. No? I don't think it's my specialty. I th- I think I've realized where I'm good at is in front of the camera mm-hmm. and being creative. And it's not running a business like that. Mm. Maybe one day. But for me, I think my my specialty is probably in front of the camera. But you, you don't want to like partner with anybody on something? No, I absolutely would. Yeah. yeah, I would. Do you have any ideas? Um, something personal finance related for sure. Yeah, there's one, there's one actually that that I will be signing soon, hopefully. Um, but it's just as an advisor because I really like. I won't shout them out yet because mm-hmm. uh, it's still being educate. Built, but huh? <laughs> Is it educate? Educate. No, it's not. Is educate. It the <laughs> no, all I will University? Say, all I will say is that Mint is shutting down, and so Ooh. it's. In my opinion, a substitute for mint that's better. Okay. In my opinion. So, and I see potential and I really like the the creator of it a lot. So you're not dropping a course on Educate.io? No. What's <laughs> Educate.io? It's the Iman course. <laughs> oh, no. <I> <laughs> online ed- education company or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I haven't it's heard of it. It's not a course, brother. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's online education. Yeah. It's a platform. That's right. Yeah. Um, didn't you almost buy the Tesla Roadster? Oh, I did. Oh, you did buy I it? I did buy that. Where's it at? <laughs> uh, it's on the other side. Mm. You still have that? I still have that. That's another investment. <laughs> is it? Is it? Is it up? What do you like mean? The is investment it is it up now or what? Um, I don't know. the 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 issue. So, I sold Tesla stock at three hundred and I think it was three fourteen a share. I say it in the video. I sold the Tesla stock at three fourteen a share, and I put that money into the car. Because I felt the car long term would be a better investment than the stock. The stock right now is trading at 180, 190, something like that. So relative, the money is better off in the car than the stock. And that stock, I think I paid like five grand for that initial stock that turned into the Tesla Roadster. Mm. So the hard part with the Tesla Roadster is that it's only one of 26 that were ever made in yellow. And of the ones that actually still exist that aren't salvaged or just don't run anymore i think there's less than like 18 of them still on the road so i don't know what that car would sell for the Mm -hmm. the last one sold i think it was 130 but it was it was an older model but it had less miles Mm. mine's a 2010 with more miles so it really just depends what a collector would pay for a unique car that's yellow do you Um, ever drive that sometimes really yeah is it like a real car what do you mean a real car? It's got a motor in it and stuff? It's electric. Yeah, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, but it's like it's a, a real car. It was like handmade almost. Yeah. Like the shell is uh, from uh, yes. something else and it's... Uh, kind Lotus. of. So the chassis is a Lotus Elise. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then they got the Lotus Elise chassis and they realized that the battery wouldn't fit in, in the chassis. 
So what was supposed to be a very basic Lotus Elise, Tesla body panels, electric motor in the back, turned into them stretching the chassis, widening the chassis, making their own body parts. And so people look at that in a Lotus Elise side by side, they're like, oh, it's the same car. But the Tesla Roadster is only 7% Lotus Elise. Elon Musk had to completely re-engineer every aspect of the car besides the steering wheel, the little interior bonnet thing, and the mirrors. Like, almost everything else is unique to Tesla. Oh, and the seats. They used Lotus seats, but they read, like, did the stitching on the, the seats. Okay. But for the most part, it's 93% Tesla. No, it's a one -off. I, I like this mindset, though. I'm about to start buying, like, the craziest cars <laughs> and justifying them as investments. But you know what? There's no cars that I see right now that I think are good investments. Everything seems to be coming down. Really? Yeah, because I would be the first one to, to look at good investment cars. Like, if I were to guess anything, mm -hmm. I think the SLS AMG, but prices are starting to come down. Mm -hmm. The second gen Acura NSX, I think is a yeah. really great car. The, I was about to say the six-speed Murcielagos, but it's like they're mm. already so high. Yeah. Um, gosh, the BMW Z8s are cool. What about the E46 M3? They're so high already. I mean... You, you think they won't go higher? They might, but everything seems to be coming down. Like, everyone was about those air-cooled Porsches for a while, or like the 90s Porsches, and they're, they're high. Can they continue going higher? I don't know. I feel like the craze for cars going up in value and collectible cars is, is simmered down. Like, this car has gone down probably 10% mm -hmm. from the peak. I don't see any catalyst of why this car will continue going up. The only thing I could think of is that they like completely stopped making any new new four GTs. And they've already like capped off the waiting list. But if they say like, okay, we're retired, we're done, like maybe. But I don't know. I just don't see it right Dude, now. Dude, speaking on the car market, this this story kind of hurts me. It hurts speaking about it. But like I started seeing all these videos talking about car market is crashing, red thumbnail, all this, this and that. And then I started thinking about how to make money from that. And so I ended up looking into what can get hit if the car market does crash. And I found out uh, about a few companies that finance people with bad credit on vehicles. And I started shorting that and I just ended up losing a ton of money. Dude, everyone thought Carvana was going to go bankrupt. And they were like $6 a share, $7 a share. And so many people were like, the market's going to crash. They're going to go bankrupt. They're losing a ton of money. And they were like on paper. It looked horrible. And now the stock's at $40 a share. Oh. The short sellers would have gotten crushed on that. Um, I kind of thought the same as you. Ally Bank issues a lot of car loan. I bought puts. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing decent. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. call them stellar, but they're doing like fairly well, like better than you would expect. And mm -hmm. I, th I think some of that is that the people are making their car payments. They have money, and the car is not something that... It's not like a house. Like mm -hmm. a house is something they're going to continue making payments at. But like if they have a work vehicle, they need to get to, from point A to point B. Like they're probably going to continue making payments on that car. So, I mean, defaults are up, but they're still lower than pre-pandemic. Mm. So you don't see just a giant car market crash? It is going down, but I guess it's not a crash. It's, it's just adjusting be, it to normal. It could be a normal. slow burn. Yeah. You know, I think it'll be slower than people. I don't think it, it's going to be like this overnight thing. It could take a few years. But like the days of people buying cars and flipping them mm -hmm. immediately, I think are over. Mm. Um, what's that um, new Lamborghini, the off-road Lamborghini? Like this St Storetta or something? I've seen it. Yeah. But I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know so saying. that was a big flipper car. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who are like, oh, these Lambos are, they're all like selling way over ass. You get now like the new Evo and you can sell for like 30 grand over MSRP immediately. So you have a lot of these people flipping these cars, but a brand new one just sold on cars and bids for the same price that it would sell for at a dealer. Wow. And when you think that someone, and I think it was like 350 or something like that. So if you think someone paid 350 for the car, and then sales tax on top of that, another 30 grand, unless they live in Oregon. Mm -hmm. But imagine they pay sales tax, everything. Them flipping the car is them losing like 40 grand on this thing. And they'd have to be waiting like a year to get this car. So just like, eh, I think it's kind of stupid. And I think watches are the same way. I think watches are going to continue to go down in price. Do you agree with what, like, I've, I've heard a few takes online where, um, People say you do want to get as nice of a car as you can just because it's going to motivate you. Do you fall into that camp or no? 
No, I I did notice a difference though when I got I got at least a Mercedes C three hundred. Okay. When I was uh, working as a the realtor, realtor car, classic. Yeah. It's the, the white BM- one. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> the white BMW three series. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the Tesla now. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, I got uh, it was a black one, and I did notice actually a pretty big difference because I pull up at a Prius to like a five million dollar listing, people would just not take my advice seriously. Yeah. And. The trigger was like, sometimes I'd drive Jason's car and he had Mm -hmm. an Aston Martin Vanquish or a Rolls Royce. And I would take one of those cars because he wasn't using them. And I'd pull up to the showing and I saw the immediate difference in the clients Mm. or people that I've never met before. It's like this air of respect and authority that you get driving a car like that in sales. Undeniable. So when I started really seeing that difference, I got the Mercedes. And Mm. it doesn't like... It doesn't matter if it's an E-Class, S-Class. T- to most people, Mercedes are Mercedes. Right. Get the C-Class. It, it, it does 90% of everything an S-Class could do and gets you the same level of respect. I'm so surprised like, to hear that from you because I feel like you would have sales. argued the frugal side of it. For, for sales, it made a difference. Okay. Uh, and appearance was also something that I, that I I've made a video about this a long time ago about appearance mm-hmm. and sales, about how it's important that you dress appropriately. It doesn't need to be expensive. But like, make sure the clothes fit. Make sure they're ironed. Make sure there's no holes in them, and they they fit your physique. Mm-hmm. I think that's important. You don't have to spend a lot of money on that. The car, that lease, I think was four hundred dollars a month with tax. You know, for and I did a lease takeover, so no money down. I drove the car for twenty four months, give or take. The prior guy had already paid for all the maintenance on it, so I was getting a hell of a deal. It's just four hundred dollars a month, no money down. And no maintenance. TJ, you're buying a fat yeah, whip well, You know what this? it was? Swap a lease. A hurricane? <laughs> it was swap a lease. Swap a lease? Swap a lease. Swap a lease.com. Wow. That was it. And you could just lease it. You just take over someone's lease that they don't want. And they'll walk away from the mm-hmm. down payment. They just You just take over the payments. And it's I all heard done that, through Mercedes-Benz I heard that closed down though. Swap a lease? Is that still a thing? I haven't checked in a long time. Okay. I'd be surprised if they shut that down because it was a money maker. But you just go and check out what's on there. You could lease a fantastic card, no money down. But it like don't do this if you're going to like try to impress people, or like you don't work in sales mm-hmm. and it's not going to make you money. Like if you're going and like working a nine to five job and you want to like you know mob around a really nice car to impress your friend, like that's stupid. But if you find a business use for it, and that car also for me was a write off because it's like I just used it for clients. But it gets so easy to justify it. I feel like for that, that's almost a dangerous message because, like, oh, it's an investment. Oh, it's gonna in this this in this way, it's gonna benefit my business. Just look at it in context. If you're drop shipping, that car is probably not going to affect your business. If you're in face to face sales, it'll boost dro- the core sales. And you're driving mm-hmm. around clients. Certain certain cars probably will, and certain cars won't. Like 2016, 2017, you get a Lamborghini, you're making mm. quadruple the money. Now I think it works against you. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I think immediately people's first thought is scammer. Mm. You get a Lamborghini, it's like, what are you trying to sell me? Like mm. before it was oh, Lambo authority. Now it's Lambo scammer. Do you think it'll do more damage than good? I think so. Really? I do. Well, I think it depends on the level. Like if I started flexing a Lambo right now, it wouldn't be a good idea. But if you have absolutely zero flow worse, I could see it kind of making sense. I, I maybe I have no? just a different perspective on no, it. No, I also like, think that like Lambos are kind of it's overplayed. It kind of it's just it's a whole different image. Yeah. Nowadays. Like I've always wanted a Lamborghini. Like always wanted a Lamborghini. Okay. Uh, but my tastes have just changed. You know, I think in my twenties, the Lambo was like the pinnacle. You get a Lambo, you've made it. But now I just I look at a Lamborghini. I have no desire. Mm-hmm. for Lamborghini like between a Lambo and an SLS AMG I'll take the AMG every day I wonder if it's affecting like Lamborghini sales because I feel like that's just the view of them all around like it's just kind of like a slimy thing th- too no I think their sales are up really yeah I think so because they're making their cars more reliable they're making them very fast and the barrier to entry mm-hmm. for a Lamborghini is non-existent it, they're not like for Ferrari where you have to go and like sign up on this list and like oh you might not get one you have to buy all these other Ferraris first mm-hmm. maybe you'll get this mm-hmm. a Lambo is like hey you want a Lambo we'll sell you a Lambo yeah and so I think they're they're attainable for people that want a Lamborghini want to work towards that what do you think would be a good car for my personal brand that I could justify as an uh, investment Tesla you think people are going to see a Tesla and say I want to buy his scores yeah, I do. <laughs> really? I think I, I think a Tesla's a sensible car. I don't like Teslas. Let's go. 
Uh, if you had a Cybertruck, dude. Oh, okay. Mm. That would be kind of tough. I just, I see Tesla as a, as a nice, sensible vehicle. But they just have no soul. It's just so, I, I had think, a Tesla, but it's just so soulless. Soul. I, no, they no. Do have souls. I, love I have it. one. It's like. I love it. I love, I love that car. There's no engine. There's no like personality. The new Prius. Just, I love that new Prius. It actually looks pretty yeah. good. Yeah. There's a whole thread on, I think it was Prius chat. And yes, I go on PriusChat.com. <laughs> That's great. Comparing the, the Prius to the Model 3. Okay. And they went over like very analytical details about like in what scenarios does the Prius make more sense than the Model 3? Because they're about the same price when you consider the tax credit. Um, and I tend to believe that in a lot of cases, the Prius makes more sense if you drive more than 200 miles, mm. you know, or you do that somewhat frequently. So if you're doing road trips, the Prius is better. It actually looks like a mini Huracan. It does in a weird way. If you kind of squint your eyes, it does kind (laughs) of look like a Lambo. It does, (laughs) like with a wedge kind of shape at the front. And you could wrap it in chrome, like the chrome multicolor. (laughs) It'll look just like a Lambo. I don't know if that's good for the personal brand. You could put an exhaust on it too. Mm, Core sales going down, brother. (laughs) (laughs) Core sales plummet to zero. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know if there's a good car. Honestly, I don't know if there's a good car for like personal branding now. I think Hmm. Tesla is kind of the it car. But maybe I'm just at a different point. It's probably better to ask someone who's like 21, like mm-hmm. what car they would want to see. Because for me, it's like no car. Like if you just said, I walk mm-hmm. everywhere. Like I respect I'd, that. I'd respect that. <laughs> okay. I take a bicycle. I take a scooter mm-hmm. because it's just, I don't need a car. Like I would respect that more at this point in my life. Yeah, that's the thing. If you get a car, it's got to be so unattainable that people just look at you mm. and be like, dude, it doesn't matter what you do. Like that is a sick car. I got to sell everything and get a Bugatti. Yeah. <laughs> if you get a Bugatti, I'll buy your course. Okay, wow. Okay. I'd buy it. <laughs> I'm about to make it like $3 million every, dollars for I'd the course. To every word you have. <laughs> how, much, how much is a Pagani? Depends on the Pagani. I would say on the low end, probably 1.8. The high end might be like four, four and a half. Yeah. That's... But it de- depends on the Pagani. All right. Give me a year. <laughs> <laughs> What's your number one piece of advice? So I think my number one piece of advice, and this is crucial, like, I think this is the guiding light. This is like what you have to listen to. And if you listen to this advice and implement it, I think you can get rich overnight. And that advice would be 